Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jessica Williams, and I am the Programming Manager at the California Historical Society. Welcome to our program, Frederick Law Olmsted, Bringing Nature to the City with historian Lawrence Cotton. Before we do anything else, I'd like to acknowledge that the California Historical Society is headquartered in San Francisco in the unceded territory of the Ramatush Ohlone. It is our job at CHS not only to remember this fact, but also to make California's rich, complicated, and diverse past a meaningful part of contemporary life. We do this through public programs like this one, through our research library and collections, and by hosting exhibitions. We have a new exhibition on view, Mapping a Changing California, selections from the 17th to the 20th century. Our galleries at 678 Mission Street are open Thursdays and Fridays from 12 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., so please visit. There are some quick housekeeping matters that we need to attend to before we move on to our program. First, I need to tell you that this program is being recorded and the video will be available for viewing on our YouTube channel or on the past programs page of our website in the next few days. We are delighted to be presenting this program live and we will be taking questions at the end from the audience. Please use the Q&A feature, which is at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many questions as we can. For any comments or conversations, please use the chat box also located at the bottom of your screen. We are thrilled to see so many of you here tonight. It lets us know that you're interested in our programs and we want to continue to bring you these kinds of programming, but we need your help to do so. So in a few moments, we are going to launch a brief poll and we invite you to answer a few questions. Your participation helps us access important grant funding for programs like this one. This is completely voluntary and anonymous, and the results will not be shared with the audience. It's just a few multiple choice questions, and you'll have about two minutes to answer them. Be sure to admit, uh, hit the submit button at the end of the poll. Okay, we're going to launch the poll now. Here we go. Thank you all so much for participating. We truly appreciate it. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker for the evening. Lawrence Cotton, currently based in Portland, Oregon, a city that benefits from an Olmsted master plan park system, originally hails from Boston, renowned for its Olmsted landscapes and the home base for generations of landscape design practitioners working for the Olmsted Brothers firm. A practicing public historian and writer and producer of historical films for PBS, Cotton was trained as a cultural anthropologist and brings that lens to bear on much of his work. He has worked with the tribal populations throughout the Columbia River watershed and has also worked on open space acquisition and the designs of parks and trails in the Pacific Northwest. Welcome Lawrence Cotton, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's a pleasure to have you, thank you. Well, thank you and it's a pleasure. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen so we can start with the... Oh, 
Okay, hello, and it's a pleasure, everyone. Uh, thanks for bearing with me while we uh, do our little tech technology adjustment. I'm uh, a little overwhelmed by the apparent numbers that are signed on for this particular virtual program this evening here on the West Coast, but what a delight. And again, thank you for the introduction, Jessica. It's good to know that there are so many people uh, with us today who are clearly interested in the name Olmstead, my goodness. Uh, a record number of participants apparently for such a program with the California Historical Society. So it's truly an honor to present to an audience gathered in fact by the California Historical Society. And I do want to extend my thanks to, special thanks to Jessica Williams who has put so much time into the planning for this event. I realize that there are many arguments for presenting such programming online. Uh, yet bef before too long, I do hope to revisit the San Francisco Bay Area where I once lived and have ties through family and my network of friends. At the same time, I realize of course that the online audience today no doubt extends throughout the state of California and well beyond. Uh, before I go any further, I actually, I often fail to mention this. I, I always assume that everyone recognizes this painting. Obviously you recognize the, the subject, the figure in the painting, Mr. Olmsted Sr., Frederick Olmsted Sr., but this is actually the famous canvas, nearly life-size, painted by John Singer Sargent that hangs quite prominently uh, inside the main house at the Biltmore Estate. And if you ever do a tour of the main house, inevitably you walk right by this uh, magnificent canvas of Olmsted Sr. So uh, before I go any further, as you many know, no doubt, April 26, 2022 marked the 200th anniversary birthday of Frederick Law Olmsted. For several years, communities across the U.S. Have, in fact were readying for this past spring and in effect this entire calendar year of 2022 to commemorate the legacy of all the Olmsteads, father, two sons, and the Olmsted Brothers Landscape Architecture Firm. My plan is this today, this evening. I'll review Olmsted's life and career. Then we will explore the Olmsted legacy across North America, including senior, but also indeed the works of the two sons and the firm. Then towards the end, we will spend a, a little more time focusing in on the Olmsted landscape legacy in the state of California, a sweeping selective tour of the state of California. And mind you, I come to you today as a generalist, uh, if you will, a popularizer uh, through my work uh, for public television and so forth. And I, yes, I will be talking about the Olmsted legacy nationally, but when it comes to California, there are certainly others out there who are far more uh, uh, astute on this topic and could give a much more fine-grained interpretation of the California portion of that legacy. But uh, let's, let's commence. Now, allow me to introduce the man of the, not only the man of the hour, but the man of the year, Frederick Law Olmsted. Here is a colorful description of the man by his friend, George Templeton Strong, a well-known public figure and diarist of the day. This is taken directly from Templeton Strong's diary. Quote, he is an extraordinary fellow, decidedly the most remarkable specimen of human nature with whom I've ever been brought into close relationship. Talent and energy the most rare. Absolute purity and disinterestedness. Prominent defects, a monomania for system and organization. He works like a dog all day and sits up nearly all night, doesn't go home to his family for five days together, works with steady feverish intensity until four in the morning, sleeps on a sofa in his clothes, and breakfasts on strong coffee and pickles. Well, I don't know about you folks, I have been known to breakfast on strong coffee, but the idea of breakfasting on strong pickles at six in the morning doesn't particularly appeal. Well, here is Frederick himself reminiscing later in his life on his boyhood. I was very active, imaginative, inventive, impulsive, enterprising, trustful, and heedless, a troublesome and mischievous boy. I was nominally the pupil of a topographical engineer, but really for the most part given over to a decently restrained vagabond life, generally pursued under the guise of an angler, a fowler, or a dabbler on the shallowest shores of the deep sea of the natural sciences. Well, that mischievous boy turned vagabond certainly eventually made something of his life, did he not? I hope you come away from this evening's program with a more enhanced feel for this man and what made him tick and the legacy that he and his sons bequeathed to the nation. Central Park, Brooklyn's Prospect Park, there's a view of the Long Meadow, Boston's Emerald Necklace, the White City of the Chicago World's Fair, 
The park systems of Buffalo, perhaps the most well-known park there being Delaware Park, same thing in Louisville, an entire park system, perhaps the best known park being Cherokee Park. Legacy parks in Chicago. Here's the Japanese garden inside Jackson Park in Chicago. Here's a wonderful island park on the Detroit River, Belle Isle in Detroit, now a state park. The Olmstead Linear Park in the Druid Hills uh, area, neighborhood, if you will, of Atlanta. The famous Biltmore Estate. The U.S. Capitol Grounds. Riverside, Illinois, one of the first master planned green suburbs in the United States, all master planned by Frederick Law Olmstead Sr. Mount Royal Park in Montreal. Here is a prospect from the park at dusk overlooking the city. And the Niagara Falls State Reservation on the New York side of the waterfall complex. Those are just a handful of the more celebrated, masterful landscapes designed by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. But if you add in the park designs and landscapes carried out by his two sons and the Olmsted brothers firm, the imprint across the geography of North America is simply astounding. 700 public parks and 6,000 commissions in the life of the uh, Olmsted Sr. and the legacy firm that would follow, which was active in Brookline, Massachusetts until the 1970s. I want to share a few items for media coverage in the past few years uh, with an initial focus on the West Coast. You know, it's interesting, though I've lived on the West Coast for some time now. In fact, I was raised in New England. And I, I do more than occasionally travel around the U.S. presenting this program. And when, e when east of the Mississippi, audiences there think they own Olmsted, particularly New Yorkers and I dare say Bostonians and Buffalonians as well. But the Olmsted legacy does indeed spread across the continent. On the opinion pages of the LA Times, two columns appeared within a few weeks of one another. Several years ago, in the fall of 2015, they left their mark on me. One was titled, quote, the great park that San Francisco needed but rejected. And that was in reference to the fact with ongoing drought, San Francisco, let's give you a picture of this park. San Francisco is having a very hard time irrigating and paying for the extreme water costs of keeping Golden Gate Park green where the underlying soils apparently drain all too quickly. Of course, many of you know there are sandy soils there. If only, this column argued, the city fathers of San Francisco had heeded Olmsted Sr.'s recommendations for a somewhat more modest park in a different location where there would have been different soil types better suited to native vegetation, San Francisco would not be in this current plight, drawing on limited water resources for its endless irrigation needs. How about this column? How about this, a column titled, Building a Livable Los Angeles. In, quote, in 1930, while LA's population on the verge of exploding, the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted were commissioned to draw up a master plan for the Los Angeles Basin. The brothers came back with intensive study of the ecology of the Los Angeles watershed, including plans for park space, flood control, traffic abatement, recreation, and the city's overall sustainable ecological development. The report was praised for its vision, clarity, and beauty, and it was immediately shelved. Well, more about that plan uh, much later in this program, by the way. Perhaps some in our audience read a few years ago an article uh, in the New York Review of Books, an article titled America's Green Giant by scholar Martin Filler. And no, that wasn't the green giant of green peas fame. That was the Olmsted, the green giant you see in front of you. In fact, uh, in this column, uh, Miller, scholar Martin, uh, Martin Filler, uh, discussed uh, several new volumes by and about Frederick Law Olmsted, including this collection of essays. After initially calling attention to the acclaim that has been received by the High Line Linear Park along Manhattan's west side, Filler writes this, quote, yet however much the High Line has enriched the post-millennial megalopolis, its social effects pale in comparison to the revolutionary vision of the public park as promulgated by its greatest American exponent, the 19th century polymath, Frederick Law Olmsted. Well, just to give you a sense of the path that brought me to this film project, uh, some of you are aware of the film project, some not, but when I was young, it really is the, what brought me into the Olmsted arena, if you will. When I was young, I would visit the house of my maternal grandparents, very near Boston's Franklin Park. As an adult, I would walk along Olmsted's Back Bay Fens and the Fenway, there's a famous footbridge, to visit the Museum of Fine Arts and the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in uh, downtown Boston. I would jog around the Jamaica Pond and botanize and stroll around the Olmsted-designed Harvard Arnold Arboretum. 
those are just uh, all those parks are, are integrated into Boston's famed Emerald Necklace, a crescent of Olmsted designed parks and parkways that wind around a major portion of the city of Boston to this day. I would eventually visit Prospect Park. Sorry, I would eventually visit Central Park, but then indeed I would come across Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And the first time I entered through this arch, the Endale Arch and looked through into the expanse of the long meadow there in Prospect Park. Tears welled up in my eyes as I was simply overwhelmed by its sheer beauty and utter perfection. This was decades before it was a glimmer in my eye that I would perhaps uh, work on a film about uh, Olmsted. Now, I expect some in the virtual audience today saw, in fact, our PBS film. Oh dear. Phone. Let's turn it off. I'm so sorry. I beg your pardon. Let's. Let's extract the phone from ringing again. Anyway, I expect some saw our original PBS film, Frederick Olmsted, Designing America. Uh, perhaps you caught the original PBS broadcast. Perhaps you managed to locate it on PBS or watched it on Amazon Prime. Well, I learned very shortly after moving to Portland, Oregon some 28 years ago that the entire park system where I am now was master planned by another Olmsted, the stepson, John Charles. At about 15, 16 years ago, after completion of a prior film, thinking what would be next, I reached out to an old friend back in Massachusetts, uh, Lawrence Hott, uh, an accomplished filmmaker, uh, and by the way, a co-founder of Florentine Films with Ken Burns, but Larry Hott has his own independent production company. I proposed a collaboration. Finally, in 2014, our film did premiere before live audiences in several key homestead cities across America and aired nationwide on the PBS system. I've been fortunate not only to uh, continue to screen the film since then, but I've developed this very PowerPoint program that you're experiencing today. And during these past eight years, I've presented variations on this talk across the country. I've continued to dig into the Olmsted archives, meet with scholars, meet with landscape design practitioners, revisit some of my favorite Olmsted park sites, and continually visiting new landscapes along the way. Uh, so in the time that remains, allow me to summarize salient, some of the salient content of the film, if you will, to expand upon it a little and to share some of my gleanings with you. Rather than reviewing Olmsted's entire career in this program, what I want to simply do is launch him on his career trajectory and hint at some of the stops along the curver linear path, if you will, that caused him to become America's great park maker. His early years in brief. Frederick Law Olmsted's life began in 1822 as the first son of a successful merchant, John Olmsted of Hartford, Connecticut. As a youth, Olmsted roamed his native Connecticut countryside, just as you see here, uh, in his father's saddle on horseback, uh, in virtually silent contemplative trips through the beautiful Western Connecticut, Connecticut River Valley countryside. Young Frederick attended several boarding schools in Connecticut, but he had to abandon plans for college due to wake eyesight. He briefly worked for a New York City dry goods importing firm, but the young man was captured by the romance of life at sea. So in 1843, he set off for China as an apprentice seaman. Thus, Fred Olmsted had his year before the mast, if you will, as a seaman sailing to China and back. In fact, it was a harrowing experience, as you read about it in the biographies. Olmsted did attend lectures at Yale, including one on the subject of scientific agriculture. He didn't matriculate, however. It was his younger brother. Here he is. Uh, right here, this is John Hall Olmsted, who was enrolled at Yale, and Frederick was basically the he was basically auditing classes at Yale and hanging out with Yaleys, his his and his brother's cohort of friends. Here is Frederick in the front, and notice his right arm is around the right shoulder of a very interesting fellow, fair, staring very intently at all of us out of the screen. That's Charles Loring Brace, who would go on to become a leading social reformer, a founder of the Children's Aid Society in New York, and would remain a lifelong influence on Olmsted's thinking and his, even his career path. Now, in 1846, Olmsted began to explore a career as a scientific farmer, a field that was on the rise. First, he apprenticed at a model farm near Syracuse, New York. Then with his father's financial assistance, he buys a property on the Connecticut shore. It doesn't work out too well for farming. He gives it up in short order. But subsequently, he buys a larger property on Staten Island, Tussamook Farm, and he makes some considerable improvements there. He does a, get a lot of earth moving. Boy, was he a wonderful earth mover and tree planter, moving earth, planting trees, uh, re repositioning some of the outbuildings, uh, and, and growing a vegetable garden, making considerable improvements to the property. And by the way, experimenting in this new field of scientific agriculture, experimenting in cutting edge drainage techniques that he had learned about in England. Uh, 
Uh, if you're wondering if this property still exists, that's Olmsted's sketch down below, by the way. If the property still exists, yes, it does. This is what it looks like now. I'm afraid it's not in perfect condition. It's the Olmsted Beale House on Staten Island, but there isn't, it was placed on the State Historic Register and a nonprofit organization, the Friends of the Olmsted Beale House, is busy raising funds and bringing attention to this so that it can restore as accurately and as authentically as possible the interior, the exterior, and the grounds so that it will be open for historic home tours at a, a date uncertain in the future. So stay tuned. Now, in 1850, Frederick travels to Europe and the British Isles in the company of his brother, John Hall Olmsted, and that best friend, Charles Loring Brace. Also in 1850, Olmsted is hired by the New York Times to tour the South and report, file reports from the field. More about those two chapters shortly. In 1855, Olmsted becomes partner in the firm that publishes the popular Putnam's Monthly Magazine. However, that business fails in 1857. But that same year, Olmsted's first book that comes out of his reporting for the South for the New York Times, A Journey in the Seaboard Slave States, is published. Not his first publication, but his first book coming out of that reporting exercise. 1857 is a momentous year in Olmsted's life. He is appointed first superintendent of Central Park, and it is after that that he and English-born architect Calvert Fox collaborate on this, the winning design for the park famously called Greensward. And with that success, Olmsted is appointed architect in chief for Central Park. This is the image that many of us now have of him, looking so debonair with cape and hat, a Greek fisherman's hat, if you will. And in 1859, uh, Frederick marries Mary Cleveland Perkins Olmsted, his brother's widow, and formally adopts her children. His brother died young of tuberculosis in Europe, wrote a moving deathbed letter to his elder brother, Fred, asking him to please take care of Mary and the children while he is gone, when he is gone. And thus, Fred does dutifully obey his brother's dying wish, marries his brother's widow, formally adopts the, her children, their children, raising them as his own. Uh, in 1861, Olmsted is appointed General Secretary of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, a Civil War era national medical relief effort securing aid and supplies for wounded soldiers. More on that in a few minutes as well. After resigning his appointment with the Sanitary Commission, Olmsted is appointed Commissioner of the Yosemite and Mariposa Mining Estates. He moves his entire family to the Sierra Nevada. Who knew? Frederick Law Olmsted was managing a gold mine in the Sierra Nevada. There is Frederick Law and Mary Olmsted in the frontier uh, picnicking uh, on horseback. I believe this to be the Mariposa Grove. There they are in 1864. And here is a, a, a primitive roughneck mining town of Mariposa, California, 1860, where the gold mine was based. While there, Olmsted is in California, he's appointed to the California State Commission, plays a leadership role in writing the first report proposing the permanent protection of Yosemite Valley before John Muir becomes involved with that little project of his. More about that report later. In 1865, Olmsted is reappointed landscape architect for Central Park and with Calvert Fox, he begins work on Prospect Park in Brooklyn. There is Fox on the left and their famous design co-design that they co-authored as with Greensward for Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And on Broadway in Manhattan, Olmsted and Vox open up the first office of practicing landscape architecture in the United States, thus launching a unique career. Now, over the course of his life, Olmsted experienced considerable family tragedy. I'll continue to refer to him as Olmsted Sr. during much of the rest of this talk. He experienced considerable family tragedy, early deaths of mother, brother, and children, his own near death in a terrible carriage accident in Central Park that left him maimed for life, and he was plagued by a nearly lifelong struggle with dark depression. And he was dealing with a host of other ailments toward the end of his career, fighting infirmities and utter exhaustion. He was still designing the landscape for the 1893 World Columbian Exposition in Chicago and the grounds of the Biltmore Estate and supervising the creation of these, his final masterpieces, as was detailed so well in the very popular book, The Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. Then after a few years of waning physical and mental health, he tragically lost his mind. Olmsted passed away in 1903 at the McLean Asylum on the outskirts of Boston, an institution the very grounds of which he had designed. What a story. What a life. Now, let's review certain aspects of that career. Perhaps we should say careers, right? His manifold roles of scientific farmer, social reformer, capable administrator, writer, editor, and literary publisher, landscape designer, and, and last but certainly not least, 
master park builder. By the way, to those attributes or titles, you could add sanitation engineer, public health practitioner, and proto-early urban planner. Frederick R. Olmsted Sr. was first and foremost a social reformer, and his career was central to the, to the social reform movement of the U.S. during the second half of the 19th century. He identified himself as such, as a social reformer. He was a philosopher of democracy. He read widely and deeply and wrote thoughtfully about this subject and manifested it in his philosophy of park design and in his actual park creations. Now, I'm going to leave this picture up for a little bit. Uh, this is the reopening of Sheep Meadow in the, after COVID in the spring of 2021 when it, they took down the fencing and they allowed the public to enter the meadow again. This is a couple of brief fragments of what Olmsted had to say about Central Park. Quote, it is one great purpose of the park to supply to the hundreds of thousands of tired workers who have no opportunity to spend their summers in the country inexpensively, what a month or two in the White Mountains or the Adirondacks is at great cost to those in easier circumstances. In Central Park, you will, all find, you will find all classes largely represented with a common purpose, each individual adding by his mere presence to the pleasure of all others, all helping to the greater happiness of each. You often see vast numbers of persons brought closely together, poor and rich, young and old. Now, regarding that prior comment, uh, the, 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 the wealthy, the well-off, the upper middle class had the time, had the transportation, had the monetary resources to take uh, rural interludes to experience the Catskills, uh, Niagara Falls, the Adirondacks in New England, the White Mountains. Olmsted wanted to provide to everyone, this, particularly the average hardworking citizen of New York, to have their own mini Catskills experience right there in Manhattan at next to no cost, easy access, limited, uh, uh, not a challenging duration of time to get to that park like environment. And by the way, I've heard others say that uh, Olmsted, uh, in essence, wanted to uh, provide a, a, a mini Walden Pond experience as well uh, for those who are seeking solace in nature in uh, the heart of the big, dense city. Now, uh, as one of our commentators, historian Keith Morgan said, Olmsted intensely believed in democracy and the park as a site for the enactment of democracy. In fact, one could argue, and recent scholarship has only underlined this, that Central Park was Obsted's re response to what he witnessed in the South prior to the Civil War and during the Civil War, that this great park would provide a counterpoint as a welcoming democratic space where anyone could gather regardless of origin or background, and that the park itself would point a way to the future for the, of the nation, healing post-Civil War. Though he strayed away from describing himself as such, he was indeed an artist. As is stated by historian Sarah Cedar Miller, Central Park was arguably the most important piece of American art of the 19th century. And by the way, I, I should mention that uh, uh, very famous uh, landscape architect and uh, Olmsted scholar in his own right, Laurie Olin, recently argued in the pages of the Wall Street Journal that Central Park is par excellence, the most significant piece of American art ever created in any dimension, period. Short stop period. That's it. There's no comparison. It's sui generi. Now, clearly, Central Park was the most monumental in scale. Author and Olmsted expert Elizabeth Barlow Rogers had this to say about Central Park in our film. Quote, it is a triumph of 19th century engineering, a symphonic sequence of beautiful spaces. Boy, Betsy Barlow Rogers surely nailed that. A symphonic sequence of beautiful spaces. You can enter into any of the Olmsted masterwork parks anywhere in America, including those of the Suns, and you too will experience a symphonic sequence of beautiful spaces. There is a musicality, there is a theatricality, there is multi-dimensional art for you to experience. Now, this is how, what I like to capture it. I'm going to put this famous image up. Many of you will know it. Uh, typically, it's referred to as the Oxbow. I believe the official title is After a Thunderstorm. It's by uh, Thomas Cole, considered the founder of the Hudson River School of Painting. By the way, the artist placed himself right in the landscape here. Here he is with his easel. This is an Oxbow on the Connecticut River. This is Mount Holyoke. And by the way, this isn't just a generic piece of uh, Hudson River art to me. It's intimate to me. It's a personal experience. I attended college a few miles from here at Hampshire College. I lived in a farmhouse just a mile or so. I've hiked to the top of Mount Holyoke countless times to take in this beautiful view. But what the Hudson River school painters were doing in, with pigment and brush on in two dimensions on canvas, Olmsted, early on in his collaboration with Calvert Vox in particular, 
was drawing, painting, and sculpting the landscapes of our great cities while working not in two, not in three, but in four dimensions. What is the fourth dimension? I expect everyone out there is mumbling it right now. Uh, time, time. In Olmsted's own words, I have, I have in all my life been considering distant effects and always sacrificing immediate success and applause to that of the future. And laying out Central Park, we determined to think of no results to be realized in less than 40 years. Now, one doesn't have to read too much of Olmsted and his writings were voluminous or spend too much time in his masterwork parks to realize he, his foresight wasn't just 40 years into the future. He, he was thinking and visioning 100, 200 years into the future. He was that kind of visionary. Now, I don't have time to do a deep dive into landscape design theory or landscape history today, but let me simply say that as a landscape designer, Olmsted clearly was influenced by those who came before him, practitioners of garden design, deep thinkers in the realm of art, such as John Ruskin. But in particular, I want to mention a couple of the English antecedents, if you will. The great English landscape designers, Capability Brown and Humphrey Repton. Also, we have to give a nod here in the United States to Andrew Jackson Downing, who was so influential in mid-19th century America and was really a mentor to both Calvert Box and Frederick Law Olmsted. In fact, it was Andrew Jackson Downing who introduced the two. In fact, Andrew Jackson Downing would have likely have been appointed the uh, principal architect or designer of Central Park if he hadn't died prematurely in a terrible steamboat accident on the Hudson River. I also want to offer a shorthand, folks. If you read the writers during this time period, including Olmsted himself, including even Thomas Cole, the painter, and uh, writers in England, uh, and uh, you read contemporary historical accounts of uh, the aesthetic origins of uh, the picturesque theory of, of landscape, you're always hearing about the sublime, the pastoral, and the, pic uh, the picturesque, in fact. Now, uh, it's hard to recreate the sublime in the center of a big city. Uh, the sublime, what is the sublime? It's it's Niagara Falls, it's the Adirondacks, it's the White Mountains in England, it's the crags of the English Lake, Lake District in the continent, uh, the European continent at the time, of course, it's the Alps. It's hard to recreate that in the, big, in the heart of a big city, but you can certainly recreate with some artful moving of earth and creating sinuous paths, and, uh, beautiful plantings, you can create the, the pastoral and the picturesque. So rather than describing it to in words, here it is. Here is the Sheep Meadow in Central Park, wide open sunlit meadow fringed with trees, a great place for people to gather in numbers if they so choose. And we're at the north end in this picture, we're at the north end of the sheep meadow. An easy short walk from the sheep meadow takes you into the ramble, the birding hotspot for Central Park, curvilinear paths, an enclosed woodland environment, a burbling water feature nearby, a great place for individuals to seek solitary communion with nature or perhaps to just be with a loved one. Very different in that transition from uh, picturesque to, uh, sorry, from pastoral to picturesque and back occurs many times and uh, more often than not in the great parks, the great parks of Olmsted Sr. and those of his sons and who would follow in his footsteps. Now, uh, as builder of Central Park, a little bit about Olmsted's management skills, by the way. As builder of Central Park, Olmsted successfully managed thousands of men in one of the largest construction projects to that point in time in America. During the Civil War, as director of the U.S. Sanitary Commission, in essence, the forerunner to the Red Cross, Olmsted perfected his management skills while heading up a huge supply medical relief and field hospital operation that included managing a veritable flotilla of hospital ships from the Chesapeake to the Mississippi. Here is the interior of one such ship on the Mississippi. And during this period, by the way, Olmsted reorganized the Army Medical Corps and coordinated contributions and volunteers from local aid societies. It's worth keeping in mind, folks, given what we've just been through these past couple of years during COVID, and then federal response, the largest public national health initiative that's ever occurred in the history of the United States, unless I'm mistaken. Well, at this point in time in the 19th century, the U.S. Sanitary Commission was the largest federal public national health initiative in the United States. And during that time, sanitary fairs were held in the major cities of the North. Here is one such fair in Philadelphia, 1864. And uh, by the way, often Frequently, women leaders of the day who were also leading social reformers were involved with managing these fairs and running, raising funds to support the Sanitary Commission. Here is one 
such individual depicted, Catherine Prescott Warmly, an interesting, very interesting person, who, by the way, was a nurse in the field. And she worked right alongside Frederick Law Olmsted and graphically, descriptively described how driven he was, how dedicated to the task and how driven he was. Both of them were right there attending to the wounded in the aftermath of two of the bloodiest battles of the city war, the Civil War, uh, both at Antietam and Gettysburg. Here is de depicted the USSC hospital, Gettysburg. Now, uh, as to his early writings, let's spend a little time on his writings. Obush, uh, his first publication, by the way, was a travelogue and a reflective series of essays in the volume Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. The original is on the left. You too can buy that very edition on the right. And it was at that point, particularly while exploring the English countryside, that Olmsted was working out what overarching landscape design concepts he thought best to apply to American soil, and by doing so to enhance the public park experience for everyone, not just the wealthy elite. In fact, Olmsted was particularly inspired by England's very first public park, publicly financed park, Birkenhead Park, designed by Joseph Paxton, just across the River Mercy from Liverpool, still there today, still a beautiful park today. In fact, arguably, he liberally borrowed some of his favorite design elements from Birkenhead and Americanized them, and if I can coin a word, Olmsteadized them, and placed them right into the design, the Greensward design that he prepared with Calvert Fox of, uh, for Central Park. And now, on another front, the literary republic, Olmsted spent a few years, he was a writer his whole life, but he also spent a few years as an editor and publisher. He wrote three volumes coming out of his reporting for the New York Times, his journeys in the South and the Plains, which included also uh, Texas and Kansas, by the way. Uh, in fact, they, they had a lasting impact and they're still in print. The later version of this work reissued and re-edited with a different editorial tone by Olmsted, came out, was issued as the Cotton Kingdom. It's still available today. And uh, here is a map of, of the Cotton Kingdom that Olmsted produced to uh, complement his publication. Now, his journalistic career started when he was hired by the early iteration of the New York Daily Times. He's considered basically one of the founding journalists of the New York Times, by the way. And he was hired as a roaming correspondent in what seemed to Northerners to be a foreign land, the antebellum South. When the first book was published in England, it had a huge impact on intelligentsia and it helped sway British public opinion away from supporting the Confederacy and toward the Union side when, the, uh, when the, his publications about slavery were published. And by the way, he did a detailed economic analysis of the institution of slavery and comparing slave labor with free labor in the North. And I'll also have you know, even though its language is dated and considered politically incorrect, uh, incorrect, I beg your pardon. Uh, Olmsted uh, graphic descriptions of the conditions of enslaved human beings during this time in the American South are really only next to uh, actual slave narratives from that time period. They're just extraordinary. And they're being reevaluated to this very day by uh, white and African American scholars in, in a number of different scholarly. Um, endeavors that are carrying on across the United States as we speak. And by the way, it's cited by Olmsted's book, The Cotton Kingdom, was cited by none other than Charles Darwin as, influent, as influential in his thinking about race as he was preparing the origin of species for publication. Plus, it left its mark on the young Malcolm X in the 20th century, in prison, hungrily devouring an entire prison library reading and feeding his mind as he was maturing in his political thought and coming to grips with the history of the institution of slavery in America. What an influence that one volume, that those series of writings had. In addition to his stint as publisher and co-editor for Putnam's Monthly, Olmsted co-founded The Nation magazine, and he played a key role as editor of that publication in its very early years. During his relatively brief period as, in his career, as he was a literary publisher, Olmsted befriended and edited and published some of the more prominent writers and intellects of the day, to name just a few. I intentionally have not labeled them so that you can figure it out for yourselves. But here is, we're going to go clockwise, folks. Here is Ralph Waldo Emerson, upper left. By the way, Olmsted was particularly influenced by R Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay on nature. Whoops, I beg your pardon. Let's go one back. Here is Henry David Thoreau. Here is Herman Melville and Harriet Beecher Stowe. They were part of his cultural network, if you will. And additionally, Olmsted was uh, 
friendly with the second generation of the Hudson River School pages, including his distant cousin from Hartford, Frederick Edwin Church. Here is a famous uh, canvas of Niagara Falls by Church. Well, you get the point between uh, his, his ties to the literary set, uh, to the transcendentalists, to the Hudson River School painters, uh, and you could add in the leading social reformers of the day of New York and New England. Well, his, his contacts were a veritable who's who of the arts and letters of America during this era. On one note, in our film, we did try to give some due credit to Calvert Fox, Olmsted's partner, the man who brought Olmsted into the actual design of Central Park, who also sub subsequently convinced Olmsted to return to the business of park building once Prospect Park was in the offing. Poor Vox, the sometimes neglected, lesser known partner, at least to the general public at this point in time, but a great architect in his own right, yet a man the time seems to have passed over, unlike his partner, Frederick Law Olmsted. It's important to understand the origins of the public park movement in North America at this time in the highly polluted cities of the 19th century. Trees, shrubs, and lawns, and eventually parks served famously as the lungs of the city, creating refuges of fresh air. Park advocates argued that parks provided refined imitations of nature, claiming that exposure to them would improve people's socioeconomic, uh, would improve people's character regardless of their socioeconomic status, I beg your pardon. An architect and landscape designer, Andrew Jackson Downing wrote this in 1848. You let me know if this stands the test of time. Quote, parks will be better preachers of temperance than temperance societies, better refiners of national manners than dancing schools, and better promoters of general good feeling than any lectures on the philosophy of happiness. Thank you, Andrew Jackson Downing. I think that does stand the test of time and sentiments like that reflect the influence of the romantics on the new world's attitudes towards nature. What had been seen as something previously as something separate from humans to be conquered and feared now became something humans were a part of that they could turn to for restoration. Downing and Olmsted on separate trips brought their experiences of touring European gardens and English gardens to the US, further emphasizing be the beneficial relationship between humans and nature and, that de and democratizing the public park experience. Before Central Park, there was one place in New York City where people could recreate in nature. And it was the Bicolic Lanes of the Greenwood Cemetery, still there today, not far from Prospect Park, still a very beautiful place, I have to tell you. But it, it, the common folks didn't really recreate there to any great extent. It was for the well-heeled, the upper middle class New Yorkers who would find themselves in Greenwood, go to Greenwood Cemetery after church on Sunday in their Sunday finest for carriage rides and to perambulate through this beautiful park-like cemetery. Olmsted was adamant that Central Park would serve everyone, regardless of skin color, family origin, or economic status. And I should emphasize here also that parks were seen as instruments for public health. In fact, I'm quite sure more than once, Olmsted did refer to Central Park as a public health institution. In the mid 19th century, New York and all cities were still dealing with terrible outbreaks of cholera and other diseases. In fact, Frederick Law and Mary Olmsted indeed lost their first child due to an outbreak of cholera in New York. In their arguments supporting the design for Central Park, Olmsted and his collaborator Vox wrote this in 1868, while you, we have another picture of Greensward. This is Olmsted and Vox. There is no doubt that the more intense intellectual activity which prevails equally in the library, the workshop, and the counting room makes tranquilizing recreation more essential to continued health and strength. Civilized men are growing more and more subject to insidious enemies to their health and happiness, and against these the remedy cannot be found in medicine or in athletic recreations, but only in sunlight at such form of gentle exercise as are calculated to equalize the circulation and relieve the brain." Unquote. Now, somewhat archaic language in there, you may not entirely agree with their case for passive versus active recreation, after all times have changed. But you could argue that, uh, in essence, along with maybe Henry David Thoreau and subsequently uh, John Muir, they were early proponents of what could be called forest bathing, a concept that is, in fact, originated in Japan, the modern version of which originated in Japan, much in vogue at this time. I have to wonder, folks, a little bit of an aside for me, I have to wonder what Olmsted and Vox and Henry David Thoreau and John Muir would think if they were with us at this time. If they, when they see individuals wandering through a park-like environment with little protuberances jutting out of their ears, clearly listening to their own internal soundtrack and nearly oblivious of the sounds of nature, or even worse, like this trio on a park branch. Now they're nameless. I don't know who they are. I'm not, nothing personal against this, 
trio. Uh, but now they may be solving the problems of the world, but you know what they're doing as they're enhanced, entranced by their shimmering screens. They're paying attention to their social media feeds and they're oblivious of the natural world around them. What would Mr. Olmsted think? I think he would be frowning. Well, enough of my silly aside, folks. Now, our film zooms in on the stories of Central Park, Prospect Park, Buffalo, and Boston's Emerald Necklace. A few comments about those projects before I move on. Olmsted and Vox, by the way, considered Prospect Park their masterpiece. As for one, they weren't hemmed in by a rectangular area, a rigid rectangular area, as they were at Central Park. They didn't encounter nearly the same level of political or fiscal interference as they did at Central Park. They didn't need to make as many compromises with their initial design as they did at Central Park. So they considered it their masterpiece. And by the way, speaking of which, I hope I have a picture for you. When I first entered, yes, Endale Arch many years ago, it looked like what you see above. In fact, just until a couple of years ago, it looked exactly like what you see above. It's been recently restored. This is what it looks like now below with the original zebra wood paneling as was designed by Olmsted and Vox. Wow. Gorgeous, how beautiful, how magnificent. Take yourself to the Grand Army Plaza entrance, walk through the Endale Arch to take in, uh, to behold the Long Meadow there at Prospect Park. It is quite the experience. What about Boston, my hometown? Now, the before the Emerald Necklace, it was the fence, the Back Bay fence. This predated the work on the Emerald Necklace, by the way. And it was, in fact, the transformation of a tidal basin that were, in essence, part of the public sewers for the city of Boston. Arguably, this can be pointed to as the first true wetland restoration project in the history of America, as far as I know. I could talk about many of the delightful discoveries in the making of this film. In fact, one was Buffalo. Before beginning research on the film, I hadn't been to Buffalo since I was six years old. I had but a dim memory. But arguably, the Olmsted Park system there is... Uh, arguably the best uh, preserved and maintained in all of America. Note, I say system. And here is the key. It was the first integrated park system ever to be designed and built in the United States. Look at those veins and arteries. Look at the, those of the parkways. And then there are traffic circles, which are landscaped. It's an entire integrated system of parks. The whole idea behind it was to think of the city of Buffalo as being contained within a, ma a giant park or a system of parks so that anyone, no matter who you were, where you lived, what your background was, could have easy access as a pedestrian, as a bicyclist, maybe as an equestrian, to a park-like environment. And interestingly enough, Olmsted and Vox did that in Buffalo at this point in the 19th century. Every park system in America is still aiming to that for that very goal today. Isn't that interesting? By the way, Buffalo literally planned the growth of the city around the Olmsted park system there. This is where Olmsted demonstrated he was an early urban planner. Here are about a couple of images, Delaware Park on the left, Front Park on the right. Here is a couple of images of the park of the parkways. Note how wide they are, in particular note how wide modern day Bidwell Parkway is on the right. That's historic Lincoln Parkway on the left. They're not narrow green strips. They are literally linear parks, large parks, large linear parks that connect the even larger parks and traffic circles all throughout the uh, penetrating, if you will, the city of Buffalo in the 19th century and still to this day. By the way, not far from downtown Buffalo, in fact, not far from Bidwell Parkway, you can find this, the Richardson Olmsted Complex. That would be architect H.H. H. Richardson and Frederick Law Olmsted. This started out life as the Buffalo Insane Asylum. It's been completely restored, the building and the grounds designed by Frederick Law Olmsted. You too can go there to take tours. What an extraordinary complex. Also, also, an easy drive, an easy drive, of course, from Buffalo is Niagara Falls. Did you know that in the 19th century, much, not all, but much of Niagara Falls, in fact, looked like this? And this is but one of many such mill districts. Uh, the falls were largely dammed and captured for the purpose of industry. There was one small area of naturalized waterfall that you had to basically pay a, a, a commutation fee to go up and over a blind in order to get a glimpse of the natural waterfall. Well, the city leaders of Buffalo reached out to Mr. Olmsted and they said, Mr. Olmsted, what can you do to help us return this waterfall to a natural state? Olmsted re reached out to the greatest writers of the day uh, in, in the U.S. and in Europe and uh, industrialists and business leaders and social reformers. He recruited a large group to create the Free Niagara Movement or the Free Niagara Association. And it actually was, in fact, the first national preservation, the first national campaign for scenic preservation. 
in the history of the United States. First national campaign for scenic preservation in the history of the United States, the Free Niagara Movement. And by the way, uh, it did result, of course, in unprecedented legislation on behalf of the state legislature of New York to create a state reservation, the first state park ever created in the nation. And they hired none other than Olmsted and Vox to design this state reservation on the New York side of the waterfall complex. And I want to focus on this. They considered this their crown jewel, their pride and joy, Goat Island, above the waterfall. Sure, the waterfalls themselves are beautiful, are stunning, are majestic. Uh, but go out to Goat Island, take the Goat Island Bridge, and then the second bridge, there it is, pedestrian bridge to the Three Sisters at Goat Island. Surround yourself with those rapids above the waterfall complex. It is a unique and entirely different kind of experience. If you have not done it, make sure the next time you visit the Niagara Falls State Reservation that you have the Goat Island experience, everyone. Very important. That's the Olmstead experience there. Now, let's talk about John Charles Olmstead quickly, the elder of the two sons, also known as John C. Olmsted, sequentially nephew, stepson, and business partner of Olmsted Sr. He learned his father's acute skills of reading the land, understanding soils and vegetation types. He acquired his father's artistic skills as a draftsman and as a designer. He joined his stepfather's firm in 1875 after graduating from Yale. And before his father's retirement, he worked with his father on many projects, including the aforementioned Back Bay Fens, the Biltmore Estate. Then as senior partner with the Olmsted Brothers firm, he led the Essex County, New Jersey, park system project. Did you know that there's an absolutely gorgeous park and parkway practically right in the heart of downtown Newark? Here it is Branchbrook Park with the cherry trees in full bloom in the spring. What a beautiful park and parkway it is. And by the way, the first countywide park system in the United States helmed by John C. Olmsted. He also worked, uh, by the way, subsequently in Atlanta, Louisville, Chicago, and Chicago park systems. And you're going to hear about his work in the Pacific Northwest because he left a huge mark, indeed, where I am, across both urban and rural landscapes, from Idaho to Victoria, BC, and points in between. He was invited out here by the cities of Portland, Spokane, and Seattle. In essence, they cost share because none of them could afford, afford him solely. And upon his first visits to the area, he was struck by scenes like this. Scenes like this. Here, that's a Puget Sound scene, a characteristic Puget Sound scene. Also, he was captured by vistas like this. You can barely make it out, but there's Mount Rainier hovering southeast of downtown Seattle. This is a picture from the 1920s. He wanted to incorporate vistas like this, particularly in his parks in Seattle, obviously. But I do want to point, before I uh, detail those parks, I do want to point out, it's very interesting, folks, how John C. Olmsted's appearance changed as he spent more and more time in the Pacific Northwest, just as his father traveled by train around the country. Here was John C. Olmsted traveling by train back and forth from Boston to the Pacific Northwest. He left Boston the very perfect proper Bostonian. He spent more and more time in the Pacific Northwest and look what happens. He becomes Sherlock Holmes. It's uncanny. The only thing missing is the pipe. The funny thing is I moved from Boston to Portland, Oregon, yay, many years ago. The same thing happened to me. That's my winter look in the Pacific Northwest and I even have the pipe to go with it. That's right, I do. Now, he developed master, plan he developed master plans for all the three cities, but let me focus on Portland here briefly and the world uh, the World's Fairs that he did for both Portland and Seattle. Here is the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition of 1905 that put Portland on the national map. He did the same thing a few years later, the AYP Exposition of 1909 in Seattle. Notice the sight lines. Notice the viewshed, the sight lines here. This is the, all these buildings would disappear. Uh, most of them would. They're uh, World's Fair. They're temporary. But he, this will remain. This is the Court of Honor. This is the Drumheller Fountain, Rainier Vista. Exaggerated more than a little bit in this art card, if you will. Notice what happens to this very landscape. It transitions to the modern day campus of UW, University of Washington. Here is the Court of Honor, the, uh, the Rainier Vista, and this is the modern campus of UW. There in the background, much more accurately depicted in this uh, aerial photo is Mount Rainier. So the AYP Exposition Grounds, in fact, becomes the modern campus of UW in Seattle. Boy, what a... What an imprint he left in Seattle. What a park plan. 35 parks connected by parkways, most of which are still there today and still in good shape. Doesn't this remind you of the Seattle Plan Commission created by his father years earlier in Buffalo? Yes, of course. And here's but a few of those parks. Here is Volunteer Park. Here is Green Lake Park, one of my favorites. 
And here is the Washington Park Arboretum. What a collection of parks and parkways in Seattle. Another whole program could be done about, uh, of course, the Pacific Northwest. Let's go to Portland. This is my neighborhood park in Portland, where virtually I'm speaking to you from right now. Uh, and this is uh, literally a neighborhood park for me. And uh, it was a master plan, part of the Olmsted, John C. Olmsted master plan, but actually carried out by a mentee, if you will, uh, 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 Patrick M uh, Emil Misch. Emil Misch, who was mentored by the Olmsteads in the Boston office, but subsequently became Portland's first park superintendent and actually designed the parks in the Olmsted aesthetic. Now, what else in Portland? Olmsted, in a 1908 par uh, uh, parks report to the Portland Parks Board, suggested that the city ought to uh, protect this vast forested landscape that overlooks the city of Portland. Here's another example. This is Forest Park. Down there is the Willamette River Corridor, the St. John's Suspension Bridge. This is downtown Portland. At 5,200 acres and growing, it is the second largest urban forest reserve in the United States. And it is riddled with uh, trails. What a collection of uh, recreational trails that are available for the wider public of the Portland, Vancouver metropolitan area. And it has pockets of old growth trees. And by the way, it is a wildlife corridor connecting uh, uh, to the coast range and large critters, elk, uh, Roosevelt elk, black bear, and cougar come right to the edge of the Portland metropolitan urban area thanks to uh, the Forest Park, which is in the collection of Portland's parks, largely, not completely, but largely thanks to the recommendations of John C. Olmsted in that 1908 report. Now, in order to introduce the son, I want to talk, the second son, that is Olmsted Jr., I want to talk a little bit about the World Columbian Exposition and the beginning of the city beautiful movement in America. Here is that exposition, 1893. The whole idea behind the city beautiful movement, in fact, the elder Olmsted had worked out uh, further developed his ideas for planning a comprehensive system of parks, shaping the land to create spaces that seemed natural, but in fact had been highly designed to achieve a particular effect. And he believed that cities could be improved through the application of the principles of landscape architecture. In a democracy, Olmsted argued, the health of the republic relied on the civic health of the voting population, and that public parks in and of themselves could enhance the civic strength of a community. And planning uh, with a comprehensive view was a new idea in North American cities. Up until then, cities grew in a haphazard fashion. And uh, the no notion of guiding city development to improve living conditions and promote economic development gained currency. And what became known as the City Beautiful Movement had, in, in fact, its roots here in the World Columbian Exposition of 1893. Lake Park in Milwaukee, by the way, is comes a little later, but it's uh, around that time, I beg your pardon. And it's often pointed to as a City Beautiful era park. And there's a whole Olmsted park system in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by the way. But here, uh, building the city beautiful. And here is the individual I want to focus on, Daniel Burnham, architect Daniel Burnham, the impresario behind the World, the world Columbian Exposition, famous for this expression, make no little plans. He used the exposition to showcase how architecture, landscape design, and art, visual art, and plan development could create the white city. Here is the Olmsted plan for the World Columbian Exposition as the senior landscape architect brought in to collaborate with his architectural colleagues. Now, I realize it was a folly. Uh, it was a functional space uh, that contrasted sharply with the many chaotic and disorderly urban areas at the time. But like all World's Fairs, it was a folly and a utopian fantasy, if you will. But it did set something in motion, including what would become known as the Macmillan Plan for Washington, D.C. Speaking of the Macmillan plan, we'll turn to Junior, often referred to as Rick, the younger brother who also was brought into the family practice. He left a considerable mark across the United States. He was born on Staten Island, the son of Frederick Law Olmsted and Mary Cleveland Perkins Olmsted. Uh, from his earliest years, Rick Olmsted was aware of his father's fervent desire to have him carry on both the family name and profession. From early on, the father insisted that this young son become far better educated in botany and horticulture as the father felt inadequate in both those topics, if you will, inadequately trained. He wasn't formally trained in those topics. In the waning years of his life, the father included this son in the culminating projects of his own career while still a student at Harvard. In fact, young Olmsted spent a summer working in Daniel Burnham's office as the World Columbian Exposition of the Chicago uh, World's Fair arose. And after graduating in 1894, Rick spent an entire year on site in Biltmore, at Biltmore, uh, working on this 100,000 acre estate being de developed for George Vanderbilt in Asheville, 
North Carolina. Here's another image of the Biltmore Estate Gardens. Following his father's formal retirement in 1897, he became a full partner with his half-brother, John Charles, in the family business. There is the family business and the family home, Fairstead. Now the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site in South Brookline, Massachusetts. You too can go there for uh, a National Park-led tour to take in the exhibits, see films, uh, visit the drafting rooms just as they existed, dive deep into the archives if you have some research activity to pursue, tour the beautiful restored gardens and grounds. Uh, by the way, both father, uh, both of uh, the sons played, along with others, including Beatrix Farron, by the way, played a key role in founding the ASLA, the American Society of Landscape Architecture. Junior also helped establish and taught at the first professional landscape architecture program in the nation at Harvard, the Harvard Graduate School of Design, influencing generations of landscape architects and urban planners. He emerged on the national scene in 1901 when he was appointed to the Commission of Fine Arts for the District of Columbia, commonly known as the Macmillan Commission that would produce this, the Macmillan Plan. Charged with interpreting for the 20th century, Pierre Charles L'Enfant's visions of the nation's capital. Olmsted worked with his father's colleagues, in fact, from the Chicago World's Fair to transform Washington into a work of civic art. A partial, but partial, but partial listing of Junior's projects in the nation's capital reads like a guide to Washington, D.C., including the National Mall, the Jefferson Memorial, the Roosevelt, I Roosevelt Island, the National Cathedral Grounds, the National Zoo, here is the National Zoo, the White House Grounds, here indicated as the Executive Mansion, and Rock Creek Park and Parkway. By the way, speaking of the nation's capital, I do want to remind you that Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. also left his mark there. He did extensive landscaping work on the U.S. Capitol grounds, including reorienting to the, the entrance and designing and overseeing the installation of the Capitol steps. I'm going to repeat that just one, folks, the Capitol steps. Remember, Olmsted Sr. saw all his public commissions as public spaces where Americans would enact democracy. Well, in August 2015, you might remember the National Park Service hosted a special event commemorating the 150th anniversary of this report, the Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove of Big Trees. That report is largely credited by the National Park Service with providing the basis for the creation of Yosemite National Park. And uh, it's a preamble, really. It's a preamble, in fact, Arguably, just as with the Constitution, it's a preamble not only to the creation of Yosemite National Park, but a preamble to the creation of our entire National Park Service. Because you might remember the National Park Service celebrated its 100th anniversary in 2016. In fact, it was Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. who played a key role in writing the Organic Act of 1916, the founding legislation for the U.S. National Park Service, like father, like son. And for 30 years, Rick and the Olmsted brothers advised the National Park Service on issues of management and the conservation of scenic resources. He left his mark, he and the firm left his mark uh, on national parks from coast to coast, including, here's but a few, Acadia National Park in Maine, the Everglades in Florida, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and Yosemite National Park. There are others where the, he and the Olmsted brothers left their mark, by the way. I've already given you a glimpse into the Olmsted legacy in my region of the country, the Pacific Northwest, but where else can we find landscapes in the American West? There are a few, by the way. I'm going to take you initially to the Rocky Mountain states before we turn to California, in particular Colorado. The most significant site there is, in fact, oh, I beg your pardon. Let's, okay, okay, I beg your pardon. Let's talk about, I'm sorry, I changed the order of things. Bear with me, folks. Let's talk about the Olmsted firm's work in uh, residential complexes before I return you to the West. First, remember the senior did his work in Riverside, Illinois. I'm not going to spend time on Riverside, but I want to point out the sites that were uh, residential sites uh, designed by the Olmsted brothers on the spine of the East Coast, starting from north to south. Forest Hills Gardens in Queens, Roland Park in Baltimore, and Mountain Lake Estates in Lake Wales, Florida. By the way, what is this here? That's the Carillon, that's the singing tower of this, Bach Tower Gardens in Lake Wales, Florida. It is a jewel of a botanical garden and initially started as a bird refuge, really one of uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr.'s masterworks in the entire country, certainly in Florida. And part of the reason I mention this is because Junior also was involved in residential projects in California. 
But before I do that, let's talk about the American West. Let's start with Denver. In fact, the entire park system there, the Denver Mountain Park System, is a Olmstead park system, Olmstead Brothers. Uh, the oldest and most well-known of these, perhaps, is Chief Hosa uh, Park, uh, Chief Hosa Lodge. There it is in Genesee Park. Chief Hosa Lodge on the left in Genesee Park, which actually has a resident herd of buffalo. But perhaps some of you um, are maybe even more familiar with another park because it houses or hosts, if you will, the venue for the famous Red Rocks Amphitheater. Where is the Red Rocks Amphitheater? In the Red Rocks Park, which is part of the Denver Mountain Park system. Now let's come over to California finally. And before we do that, we're actually gonna talk about Boulder, Colorado. I beg your pardon. Also, there's an Olmsted Junior City Plan for the city of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, the Olmsted brothers actually did some, uh, some sweeping urban plans for the city of Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we should not forget. And here is a picture of the city of Boulder today where they did leave their mark unquestionably. Now, finally, I apologize. This is a different program than the one I normally present. Uh, here, we're going to start in the East Bay at Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland. This is an early image. This is Olmsted Sr. This is uh, one of the few projects he worked on when he was in California, Mountain View Cemetery, Oakland. Here is the Piedmont Funeral Home it, at Mountain View Cemetery. Look at that landscape and uh, it's noted uh, for its notables. It is, if you will, the Mount Auburn Cemetery of the San Francisco Bay Area, where many of California's leading historic citizens are interred. But here it is today, all designed, landscaped by Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. There's two images for you. It overlooks the city of Oakland down below with that bay in the middle. And of course that big city across the bay that all of you San Franciscans will recognize. That is an Olmsted Sr. landscape. Now, uh, he also did a plan for the University of California. He sketched out the basics of a plan, I will tell you. He sketched out the, a preliminary campus plan. He worked on it, it was presented in 1866. However, the plan has, the real plan has been lost. Uh, the report apparently addressed the larger issue of how to place the university in the context of its environment nestled beneath the hills of the East Bay. But the campus as we know it today uh, was actually designed by a series of subsequent architects. So there is no direct Olmsted legacy, landscape legacy on that campus today, except for hints on the backside near the Botanical Garden. Now in 1863, uh, also, uh, Early on when Olmsted was out there, senior, he looked into the east hills on the east of San Francisco Bay and he saw something special. He imagined a park up there, the hills above the cities of Berkeley and Oakland. But second, seven decades later, in 1930, the Olmsted brothers, uh, now run by his son, uh, drew up a plan, the proposed park preservation, reservations for East Bay cities. Perhaps the most famous of these is the Tilden Regional Park. This is the East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, it's an entire park system. It's an entire regional park system. Everyone there in the Bay Area knows this. This is the Round Valley Park. This is the Redwood Park that was added. To, these were all added to the system. But here it is. It is a portfolio now of 65 parks, 65 parks in the East Bay Regional Park District, all originally master planned by Frederick Olmsted Jr. working with a Forest Service uh, planner and architect Ansel Hall at the time, by the way, there in the city of Berkeley. Now I'm going to be doing this with broad brush strokes. I can't spend a lot of time uh, delving down into the finer grain detail with all of the California landscapes. You already heard about uh, San Francisco. Here is the Olmsted plan overlay. I'm sorry, it's a poor image. It's, an over, it's the overlay of the over on the right, the darker green. That's the uh, original Olmsted plan senior for a, a collection of pleasure grounds for the city of San Francisco. Off to the left, pale green is obviously the modern, the location of the modern uh, park of Golden Gate Park as we know it. You can see it is a very different design park very different features in a very different section of the city. The city leaders of San Francisco at the time chose to ignore his recommendations. They chose to create rather something else. But they did bring in, they turned to William Hammond Hall, many of you know in San Francisco, with his proposal uh, for Golden Gate Park as we know it today. And uh, here is another image of that park in 1874. Uh, apparently, by the way, Olmsted praised uh, William Hammond Hall's design once he saw it. Uh, 
though I understand that William Hammond Hall did not in fact last long there at Golden Gate Park. Within a few years, he was replaced by the long serving park superintendent, John McLaren, who held sway and influenced the future look of this great urban park for some 50 years. Now, and here it is looking so green. I, I don't know, is it still looking that green right at this moment? I don't know whether you've had sufficient rain for it to turn so green at this moment in time, but sure is beautiful in that picture, which was produced for the uh, Lonely Planet publication, by the way. Uh, how about this, St. Francis Wood? This is Olmsted Brothers. That's not their actual design, but that is a uh, real estate present map by the uh, Mason McDuffie Company, a new residential area in Southwest San Francisco. It included lots that were twice the size of the average city lot and planted parks and boulevards with good access to the city center. It was Duncan McDuffie, who was responsible for the numerous developments around the Bay Area. He hired the Olmsted Brothers firm to design the curvilinear street plan that you see before you uh, in 1913, led by the firm's representative, James Doshin. They laid out the streets to conform with the site's natural topography. The community was designed to be strictly residential. Here is the marketing for St. Francis Wood. Uh, and here is then and now. And I haven't explored St. Francis Wood, so I'm going to count on those in the audience who know the area to inform me as to whether this is one and the same fountain on the right in the modern day that's depicted on the left in this historic black and white. I don't know whether it is or isn't. I'm guessing it is the modern version of the same in the same location. Perhaps someone will let me know at the end of this program. But it's really quite, uh, I, I can't delve into great details for lack of time in this program, but St. Francis Wood is really quite an extraordinary residential complex designed by the Olmsted Brothers there in the heart of San Francisco. I gather it was placed on the uh, uh, Red National Register of Historic Places quite recently. Now, how about, we're going to go south. Uh, no, we're not. We're going to go east because uh, Duncan McDuffie himself, uh, actually, uh, uh, the Olmsted brothers designed his own personal estate in the hills above Berkeley. This is the only image I have for it uh, at the moment. But there is an image of the terraced back garden of the Duff McDuffie estate in the Berkeley Hills. I gather it's still there, although it's been broken up into smaller parcels and only portions of the original Olmsted brothers design landscape still remain there in the Berkeley Hills just above uh, Berkeley in the uh, midsection of the hills, unless I'm mistaken. Now we're going to go to that famous campus south of San Francisco. Here is the Leland Stanford Junior University. This is from the Olmsted Archives. Uh, it was a uh, uh, rather contentious relationship, needless to say, between Leland Stanford and his uh, his his uh, 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 Olmsted, Frederick Law Olmsted, his architect that he was hired to design this landscape working with Stanford and coming up with a complex of uh, architectural designs and landscape designs that would produce in the end a very cohesive uh, university design. Here is the final architectural plan. My understanding is that in fact H.H. H. Richardson perhaps would have worked on this project, but he died right at around this time. But I believe Olmsted maybe had a notion of bringing H.H. H. Richardson in on this. It's distinctive for its monumental scale. Here is a, a photograph from the Olmsted archives of the entrance to Stanford's main quad. But it is distinctive for its monumental scale, its use of sight lines that extend through the campus. In its long history, the as the university has built and mo modernized, it has sought to honor the principal design elements established in Olmsted's 1888 master plan. Uh, here are some pictures of that famous campus, just so we can have some beautiful pictures of what it looks like today. This chapel, here's another image of the interior courtyard. Here is the Hoover Tower, which came subsequently. Here is an aerial view, and you see how it holds together so cohesively, both the landscape and the uh, uh, modern Spanish terracotta architecture, if you will, from that era. Now, let's head uh, in throughout the state. The Olmsted brothers were brought in twice over in the 20th century to master plan the entire California state park system. In the end, 125 parks on in what is considered one of the most stellar park systems in the United States. Uh, here are the redwoods in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Olmsted is in his report to the state of California uh, board uh, for the state park system, recommended that the, they set aside additional areas and protect them in state park 
landscapes, one of which was recommending that they protect the redwoods in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Unfortunately, in those several parks there, many of you know those redwoods have been seriously damaged by recent ravaging fires. Homestead also recommended protecting this particular desert, the Anza Borrego Desert. There it is in full bloom in the spring, and unless I'm mistaken, it is the largest state park in the entire state of California. And I might add that uh, in a publication called Landslide, the Cultural Landscape Foundation has just listed uh, a number of Olmstead landscapes uh, across the United States that are at threat for one reason or another. It included just yesterday, unless I'm mistaken, the entire California state park system, largely due to the threats of climate change and uh, drought, therefore. Now, uh, there's also additional Olmstead uh, legacy in Southern California. Uh, yes, not many people know this, but Olmstead, the Olmstead brothers did some master planning for the Santa uh, real estate developers on Santa Catalina Island. They did. And I have limited detail to share with you just now, but this map is actually from the Olmstead archives. They did some pl planning there in, the, uh, in, in, in and around Avalon and the center uh, in, inhabited area of the island. They also did a, a, pl a city plan for the industrial city of Torrance, California. This is also from the Olmstead archives. Uh, they worked on, this is an example of their urban planning. In this instance, it's Torrance, California, but let's move on. I wanna focus on Palos Verdes. Here is Palos Verdes Estates, a major real estate scheme, needless to say. In 1913, a group of investors purchased 25,000 acres on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. They hired the Olmstead brothers to develop the expansive coastal landscape. James Frederick Dawson served as the project lead, along with Olmstead Jr., uh, after John Charles, in fact, passed away in 1920. In fact, by the way, Olmstead Jr. and Dawson both moved to Palos Verdes in order to carry out this work. It was one of the Olmstead brothers' largest and most complex projects ever, with input from scientists, engineers, and horticulturalists that were required to transform the site from rugged, healy, lime shale terrain to 16,000 acres suitable for luxury homes, a country club, resorts, golf courses, and parkland. This is the Olmstead, one of the Olmstead brothers' plans for Palos Verdes, all with sweeping views and vistas to the Rocky Coast and the Pacific Ocean. Here is, uh, by the way, Frederick Law Olmstead Jr. and his wife, Sarah. Uh, Hall Sharples in California during this time period. Here are scenes of early Palos Verdes as it was just being developed. Here's a, uh, the La Ventana Inn, which was the first one of the one of the first properties to be built there in this new community, being created from almost from scratch. And here is early landscaping there at Palos Verdes. And here is the Vanderlip residence. He was the developer, of course, the principal developer, uh, known for. Uh, his involvement with uh, the, the development of Palos Verdes as a ongoing uh, real estate uh, exercise, real estate development. And here is the residence Villa Narcessa, uh, which was recently on the market, I gather, there in Palos Verdes. And here is an aerial overview of Palos Verdes today, which, by the way, also includes acres and acres of parkland and trails that are open to the general public. Now, we're coming to a conclusion, but here is the Panapar. California Exposition in San Diego. This is the actual Olmstead Brothers plan. They were hired in 1910 by the San Diego Building and Grounds Committee to design the landscaping plan for this exposition that would hopefully draw millions. The Pal Panama California Exposition. John Charles initially would take the lead on the project, but both brothers studied Spanish mission style architecture prevalent then in Southern California. For the grounds of the exposition, the building and grounds community constantly changed their wants and expectations, forcing the Olmstead brothers to restructure their design. The final straw that broke the brothers' back was the recommendation that not only should the entire location of the site be changed, but that a, uh, a railroad would cut directly through it. The Olmstead brothers were unwaveringly, unwaveringly opposed to both of those proposed changes, especially the addition of a railroad because this would eliminate all the possibilities of creating a semi-rural respite from the city. Uh, they actually submitted their resignation they, in 1911. They literally sent a telegram to San, San Diego saying that their professional responsibility as park designers will not permit us to assist in ruining Balboa Park. But there it is today. Uh, that's what Pal Balboa Park grew to become. Uh, but the design uh, of the exposition as you know it today really minimally reflects any Olmstead Brothers involvement. Finally, finally in Los Angeles. Here is LA Basin. 
1932, of America's most prominent landscaping and planning firms, the Olmsted Brothers and Bartholomew and Associates submitted a report to the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce that would have radically changed the city as we know it today. The report about the quote, parks, playgrounds, and beaches in the Los Angeles region was met with great enthusiasm, but it was buried and never acted upon for political and economic reasons. However, that full plan is now available in a book. This is the plan. This is the actual plan from the original report, but it's now available in book form titled Eden by Design by two noted scholars, Greg Heise and William uh, Deverell, Bill Deverell. Uh, and uh, I commend it to you. Uh, and a few years ago, I was uh, introduced to an organization in Los Angeles, Amigos de los Rios. Their staff and volunteers are focused like laser beams, trying to bring the Olmsted Bartholomew plan into the 21st century by regreening LA in the Los Angeles basin from forest to ocean, thereby creating a new emerald necklace for greater Los Angeles. And by the way, as many of you know, there are in essence competing uh, plans for regreening downtown LA and the Los Angeles River corridor. And I believe all of them cite in one way or another the original Olmsted Bartholomew plan for Los Angeles that was released and never acted upon in 1930. Isn't that interesting? Well, you're going to wonder when am I going to bring this to a close? I'm going to do so now. Now, I, I uh, during this past couple of years of COVID quarantine and social distancing, public parks have been a lifesaver for so many of us, seeking fresh air, exercise, physical and psychological health. Frederick Law Olmsted now appears so entirely prescient as for wanting to emphasize public health, mental health, and taking it even further, the spiritual health benefits of the public park experience for everyone in a democracy. As we commemorate Olmsted Senior's birthday and the Olmsted landscape design legacy during this entire calendar year of 2022, we also highlight the ever more crucial role that the public park experience plays in our lives. Needless to say, COVID and social and environmental justice movements have only greatly underlined that very fact and the urgent need to provide more green space and to distribute it equitably and to make all such spaces accessible and inviting to all. In fact, folks, it isn't too much of a stretch to say that that was Frederick Law Olmsted's intent from the very start. I'm going to leave you with two quotes, two comments. First, uh, we'll let Daniel Barnum, the driving force for the World Columbian Exposition, close out this program. When, all, when the World's Fair was set to open in 1893, at a dinner with all the artists and architects gathered to laud Burnham, for his achievements, Olmsted was actually absent on this occasion. I believe he was under the weather. They were all gathered to laud Burnham for his extraordinary achievements for this great World's Fair. Burnham himself pivoted and said this about his collaborator, quote, each of you knows the name and genius of him who stands first in the heart and confidence of American artists, the creator of your own parks. He who it is has been our best advisor and our constant mentor, Frederick Law Olmsted, an artist, he paints with lakes and wooded slopes, with lawns and banks and forest covered hills, with mountainsides and ocean views. He should stand where I do tonight, not for the deeds of later years alone, but for what his brain hath wrought and his pen hath taught for half a century. Finally, in Olmsted's own words, the beauty of the park should be in the beauty of the fields, the meadow, the prairie, of the green pastures and the still waters. What we want to gain is tranquility and rest to the mind. Is it doubtful that it does men good to come together this way in pure air and under the light of heaven? Frederick Law Olmsted. It seems to me that that prescription, if you will, rings as loud today in 2022 as it did in the late 19th century. Thank you, Frederick Law Olmsted and sons. And thank you, everyone for your time and attention today and bearing with me in this overly long, dense program. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions and to answer them and to engage in a chat with all of you, with some of you, can't do it with all 1,000 of you. Now, I do want to mention uh, that there is uh, one, uh, I, I have a list of resources. These are a bunch of books that I commend to you. I'm going to actually be providing a Word document, uh, which includes Olmsted resources, including books, websites, organizations, and more. All of these will be on the resource list. Uh, I want to go 
here. This is how you learn about Olmsted 200. I want to go here. I will bring this back. This is the proprietary website film where, it, where there's much more available than what you would find by randomly searching for it at uh, on PBS or Amazon Prime or YouTube. I will return to that, but I also want to go here. These are sources and resources. I do want to uh, point out Christine Edstrom O'Hara from the Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, who has been instrumental in helping me to come to terms with some greater detail on the Olmsted legacy in California. And she is certainly one of the leading experts on that. I also want to Hockaday, who unfortunately I, is not on this particular list. Uh, she will be on the next version of the list, but Joan Hockaday has, uh, lives in the San Francisco Bay Area, and Joan Hockaday is perhaps the leading expert on the Olmsted landscape design legacy in the Pacific Northwest. A wonderful book called Greenscapes, which might be hard to come across. It is in my list, in my bibliography. Uh, I, uh, but uh, Joan, I believe, is also working now on an endeavor pertaining to the university or institutional campuses. Uh, in the Olmsted record. So I'm happy to take uh, questions and answers. If anyone wants to reach me, this is how you can do so. Uh, Telcotton at gmail.com. Uh, but I will leave this back up again and happy to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Lawrence. That was an incredible presentation, such an extensive um, you know, coverage of the work of uh, Olmsted Senior and the Olmsted Brothers uh, firm. I had no idea that they had designed so much of what we know uh, from our parks and um, places in America. It's really quite astonishing. Um, and thank you also for the tour of the California uh, sites as well. I know for those of us in California, it's wonderful to see these uh, places in our own backyard that um, we have the pleasure of um, being able to visit. Um, uh, it's just incredible. Thank you again. And we had a lot of wonderful um, questions that have come through and um, some comments as well. Thank you all for your engagement during this talk. Um, and I thought we could just jump into some of these questions. We have a few minutes uh, that we can answer a few of these questions that have come through. Um, one question asks, um, did Olmsted receive most of his architectural training through the auditing classes that he did? No. Uh... He actually received, well, he, he mentored briefly with uh, Andrew Jackson Downing. Uh, they knew one another, they were friends. Unquestionably, he was influenced by Downing's writings uh, and the publication, The Horticulturalist. Remember, he started his life as a scientific farmer. So you could say that some of what he learned about scientific farming was based on his experience at Yale, uh, but not his artistry, uh, what would, in what would become known as landscape design or landscape architecture. He, um, the firm, the, by the way, the term, it's recently come up in some scholarly presentations. The, skirt, the term was actually already in some limited use in England, but he was the one who popularized the term in America. He and Calvert Vox with their work on Greensward. He was really self-taught. Uh, and in almost everything that he did, he was largely self-taught. He was a prodigious reader prodigious reader, uh, and he was largely self-taught in what became known as his landscape architecture practice. And uh, what happened to the old Olmsted firm? Um, it it dissolved. Mm -hmm. uh, the firm dissolved in the 1970s in Brookline, Massachusetts. At that point, it was called Olmsted Associates, its final phase, dwindling down to but a few practitioners. It was Olmsted's Associates, and uh, it dissolved. Uh, there uh, are a few Olmsted landscape dis, uh, dis architects in America currently practicing with other firms. Unless I'm mistaken, there is one such individual in the Seattle area and there's one such individual in New Hampshire, but don't quote me, I'm not sure if that's pre precisely accurate, but there's no firm as such uh, where there is a collection of practitioners uh, even under the name Olmsted Brothers or Olmsted Associates. It's completely dissolved in the late 1970s. Uh, and there's a question, you may have mentioned this uh, briefly. Uh, the Olmsted, are the Olmsted events in The Devil in the White City accurately, accurately portrayed, especially good. how they recruited him? Good, good, good question. Uh, I'd, I actually haven't reread the volume in quite a few years, and I suppose I ought to because it might yet become a limited dramatic series for Hulu or some other streaming service, although it's, that's had an up, that whole <laughs> effort 
to translate it into the medium of film or television has had a real up and down roller coaster ride. Right now, it seems to be temporarily on hold. Uh, but I, I, it seems to me it's relative. I, leaving aside the devil, let's talk about <laughs> Olmsted and Burnham. I think uh, Eric Larson did prodigious research, and I think he mostly, mostly got it right. Uh, in, in terms of Olmsted, the, the, the particulars of Olmsted and Henry Codman uh, uh, working there in uh, Chicago at that time on the extraordinary landscape, uh, bringing in the, the unbelievable volumes of trees and plants and flowers, uh, determining that electric boats are going to be the only kind of boat that he would, other than uh, gondoliers, gondoliers there in the waterways, uh, the water features of the site. Uh, many of those different aspects, uh, his his dedication and devotion to the cause, also going back and forth from there to Biltmore at the same time, and also struggling with physical infirmities and, and certainly some aspects of depression as well. Uh, I, I think that's nicely detailed by Eric Larson in the book, and I and I think quite accurate in my read, in my read, in my humble opinion. Thank you. Uh, the next question says, um, I was under the impression that Olmsted Sr.'s principal contribution to the Cal uh, Berkeley campus was city, uh, citing and orienting mm -hmm. it towards the Golden Gate, incorporating Strawberry Creek and the design of Piedmont Avenue. Is that correct? Yes, the, stra the Strawberry Creek is, my understanding is that the Botanical Garden, that the backside of the campus as it exists today is maybe closer to the original orientation, the placement, the siting of the campus that maybe is some remnant of the original Olmsted plan, but that whoever said that, that's, that's uh, I think, quite accurate. That captures the, the gist of it. Uh, but the campus as we know it today is, really doesn't represent an Olmsted design to campus. That was the point I was trying to make earlier, but it was the proposals for the orientation of, by the way, at that point, there was only one University of California. It wasn't UC Berkeley, it was the University of California. That was it. That was the campus. Thank you. Um, this question uh, is about um, Central Park. Uh, this person says, thank you for all of the background on Olmsted's mm -hmm. work as a social reformer and pioneering journalist. Mm -hmm. I wonder in this context, how Olmsted was involved in the destruction of Seneca Village for the mm -hmm. construction of Central Park. And did he or other contemporaries comment on the contradiction of just possessing black landowners for the public good? I'm going to address the last question, part of that question first. No, um, I have no, I've done some pretty diligent research on this I, because I've been curious myself. Uh, I have not found any evidence in the archives uh, that it presented any conflict to him uh, of his values, given the fact that he was actually uh, coming out of his work on the Cotton Kingdom. He actually became an ardent abolitionist. I'll have you know. Now, Here's the situation, and it deserves far more nuance that I'm able to give it in a very short time. And the best way to delve into that is to read any articles or interviews with Sarah Cedar Miller, uh, perhaps the best historian for Central Park, who came out with a prodigious volume this past spring called Before Central Park, where she delves deeply into the history of the landscape before, in fact, Central Park existed with one and a half to two chapters devoted to the story of Seneca Village. And the gist of her research is this. First of all, Olmsted wasn't there on site managing this until September, 1857. At that point already, uh, the landowners in Seneca Village, by the way, predominantly African-American, but not exclusively, there were German and Irish immigrants there as well as there were in other parts of the park. The landowners who were largely middle-class African-Americans, many of whom actually had uh, other homes in downtown uh, New York, also had properties in uptown there in Central Park. They also, there were churches, uh, there was some workshops and so on and so forth, some farms, there were, certainly there were gardens. But by the time Olmsted had come on the scene, a corrupt political administration in New York City had already actually paid market rates to purchase those properties. Market rates, according to all the real estate records, they had paid market rates to purchase those properties from the 
landowners, African-American and otherwise. And at this point, there was a much smaller group of residents there who were tenants to the city of New York. In other words, they were paying rent to the city of New York. By the way, by the way this was all a eminent domain process. Uh, at any rate, when Olmsted was finally there, there were only maybe, if I understand correctly, 20 to 30 souls, if you will, left on site during the final phase of the displacement. And he was there nominally supervising that. I don't know how deeply involved he was, whether he was there on site to see these individuals displaced or to see some of their uh, structures uh, knocked down. And most of them were, not all of them. Now, I'm not trying to uh, uh, exonerate Olmsted here, and I'm not trying to in any way uh, uh, denigrate or belittle uh, the fact that a historic African-American community, a very significant historic African-American community was entirely displaced, if not removed for the final creation of Central Park. And it's uh, looking back on it now, it's a terrible moment at that time. It's a terrible error that shouldn't have occurred, at least not in the way that it occurred. I will tell you that the Central Park Conservancy has beautiful new, sensitively nuanced, written interpretive plaques, signage all over the Seneca Park, uh, Seneca Village site. There are African-American guides working for the Central Park Conservancy and privately that are leading tours of the site. There's more and more being written and documented about the site. Uh, I myself am very curious as to whether it did present any conflict for Olmsted Sr. because he certainly knew that this last phase of displacement was going on when he was finally hired on the job at Central Park. He was only on the job during the last month, last six weeks, uh, and I don't know um, if it presented any issues of conflict of va value conflicts for him. We have no evidence of that. But uh, most of the displacement the larger volume of the displacement of individuals and families had occurred before his arrival on the scene. That's my, as you would, you would have to, I highly recommend uh, picking up uh, uh, reading interviews with Sarah Cedar Miller uh, um, or articles that she's written, which are extracts of the much larger volume called Before Central Park, which by the way, is on the resource list that I'm going to provide. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that and for the resources as well. Um, speaking of, I know that folks have been asking um, for that, and that I believe you have um, something that we can share with folks after the program. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. So, an, ex um, an extensive resource list, curated, curated and annotated by uh, by this person who's giving this talk. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful, that's, that's incredible. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we will be able to send that out to folks um, after the program where we have a automatic email that will be sent out um, with the recording to this talk is being recorded and we can include that uh, as well. Um, and it looks like people were asking for your contact information. I believe we did put that in the chat as well, but we can also include that in the um, letter to folks afterwards. Yes, and I'm happy to engage in... Uh, Happy to engage in conversations with individuals by by uh, by email or by phone if 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 it comes to that. Happy to engage with folks who have might have continuing questions coming out of this. Thank you. It's just such an amazing wealth of knowledge that you have given us here today, and it's just um, just an incredible presentation. Um, thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to uh, give it. Thank you. My pleasure. And I'll just remind everyone, and that it's it's in my resources. But I, I'm a, I'm a generalist, as is my friend and fellow classmate from Hampshire College, Ken Burns, those of us who do this kind of work, we're generalists and we count on the, the real scholars, the real experts to be our guides uh, as we delve into this kind of material and attempt to mm, synthesize the material from so many different sources to uh, reach out to as wide an audience as possible through public television films like this and through through talks like this as I give them across the country. So it's been an honor to be here today with the California Historical Society and this rather large audience out there, which no doubt includes many individuals who are in-depth scholars on particular slices of this topic, far more so than I am.
Thank you so much. We're so thrilled to have you. And um, it was wonderful. Thank you to our audience for being here as well. I, I know we weren't able to get to all the questions that were posed in the Q&A, um, but please do feel free to reach out to Lawrence Cotton if you have further questions. And we will be sure to um, share out those resources um, after the program as well. Um, and thank you again for such a wonderful and educational talk. Just very, very interesting and um, just such a wealth of vast knowledge uh, that you've shared with us today. And so looking forward to hopefully one day uh, visiting more of these sites in the future and myself. Um, thank you again, Lawrence Cotton and um, our audience. Thank you so much for being with us. If you enjoyed the program, please also consider making a donation to the California Historical Society. Your, contribute will help, uh, your contribution will help us to continue to collect, share, and honor the diverse stories from throughout our state, and we'll go ahead and put that link in the chat. Um, also, please join us for our next program called Arab Angelinos, Routes to the Southland with author Sarah Galtieri. This program will take place on Tuesday, November 8th at 5.30 p.m. online via Zoom. And you can find the registration links for this event on our website, and we will also put them in the chat as well. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you again, Lawrence Cotton, for a riveting talk, and uh, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you all next time. Good night, everyone.